Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. My name is Jackson Mummy, and each week we'll be bringing you updated information about the bar exam and what you need to do in order to make the next bar exam your last bar exam. Ready to get started? Let's jump to it. Welcome. We are uh, three weeks until the bar exam. It's exciting to have all of you joining us on today. It is Wednesday, February 7th. I'm joined today by Tracy, and we are excited to have her here. We are going to be dealing with some announcements and answer student questions. And Tracy, we're going to talk about something called the law dog. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what to be doing for the next three weeks. Let me just give you a couple of updates on things that are happening in the course. As many of you know, we do a set of videos in the first week of February leading up to the exam, talking about the trend lines and the potential areas that the exam is headed in your jurisdiction. Now, you notice I'm careful to not call it a prediction video, but it's really a preview of the upcoming exam and a review of the last exam in a little bit more detail. I have completed the videos for the UBE and for Florida, and those are now posted in your online courses. They're in lesson 1.5 in your course, and it's about a half hour video in each jurisdiction. I'm still working on the California and Georgia videos. Those will be completed no later than this weekend. And we will email you, but you can also go online and just look five and it will identify and say that this is the February, 2024 preview video. It's a chance for me to look back at the prior exam, analyze it, think about the trends, what's been going on in the test, and then looking ahead, I use a likelihood scale of one to five to say how likely I think a particular topic might be on the upcoming exam. Now, oftentimes I hear from students who say, I completely disagree with your views or predictions, and that's okay. The one thing I would tell you about these videos, however, is that I really don't want you changing your study based on what I say in the video. That is, if you weren't going to study UCC 9, and I said hypothetically that I think it's going to be a likelihood of being on the exam, I don't want you to suddenly drop everything and go study UCC 9. This is part of the reason that I wait till later in the season is precisely for that reason. I don't want you to overreact to whatever I say there. Study everything and be prepared all the way through. I'm good at identifying trends in the exam. People tend to get pretty excited or fixated about what did he say about this particular subject. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate that People believe that I've got some superpower here, but it's really just my spidey sense. And I don't want you to rely too much on it. We've got the UBE and the Florida videos already posted. Those are up in your online course. We ask that you not share it with anyone that's not in our course. And we will get California and Georgia out in the next few days. Particularly fun in Florida where, you know, who knows what they're doing. All right. Next announcement is boot camp. We have our live bar prep boot camp coming up April 26th and 27th here in Denver. This will be a boot camp with more live coaching than we've ever done before. We're going to have Amanda here. Brianna is going to be here. June is going to be here. Tracy's going to be here. I'm going to be here. And it's two full days of training and coaching for you. We're going to show you how to photo read better. We're going to show you how to make effective bind maps and really have you step into that and work with that. We're going to Talk about how you write better essays, how you write better performance tests, if you're in a performance test jurisdiction, how you take multiple choice questions for Florida or for the MBE. Uh, Brianna is going to be doing her magic, if you will, around scheduling and putting together your schedule, as well as doing some coaching on writing. June is going to be doing her mindset coaching, which is always a highlight of boot camp. It's a great opportunity to gather with a group of like-minded bar takers. The relationships that people build at boot camp become really important to them. I just heard from a student today who was talking about the students that were at boot camp with her. She's not taking the exam until July, but she's working with a couple of students that are taking the February exam and they're just helping each other and coaching each other up. We're going to cover your lunches and your dinner on Friday night. We're also going to have guest speakers, former students who have been through boot camp and been successful. That's usually a highlight for people. Boot camp is the single biggest determinant of success on the bar exam. When people come to boot camp, I can pretty much predict that they will pass the bar. 
Now, what's the process to join us on the 26th and 27th? The first step is for you to fill out a short application and to submit a refundable $100 deposit in order to secure your spot. We'll review your application, give you a yes or no answer. And if you're accepted, your $100 will be applied to your tuition. If we don't accept you, then we'll refund the $100. The cost for boot camp right now is $2,250. That's a discounted course price. Good for one more week on Valentine's Day, Wednesday, February 14th. And after that, the price goes to $2,500. So it's really important to get your application in. I'm going to ask Tracy to go ahead and put the link up. Go ahead and make that application. It only takes you about five minutes. It's pretty straightforward and simple, but we want to make sure that you're really interested in being there. This is limited enrollment. Even though we've got all of our coaching staff here, we're still keeping the size of boot camp pretty small so that you'll have the opportunity to work individually with Tracy, Brianna, Amanda, June, and myself. It, we're going to sell out, and we typically do. You can save yourself $250 by making your enrollment in the next seven days. So go ahead and get it done now. Don't wait. If you're already a photo reader, we're going to discount your tuition by $400. If you're not a photo reader, we're going to give you the photo reading course, which is worth $400. So either way, you're going to be all set there. Then we have what we call buy now, pay later programs through Klarna and Affirm. When you're ready to pay your balance for boot camp, you can pay it in full, or you can use one of those partner companies and stretch your payments out over several months, in some cases, maybe as much as a year or a year and a half. Tracy, did I miss anything about boot camp, or what's your thoughts about boot camp? If you are a February bar taker, you can reserve a spot in our next boot camp as a backup plan for only $100 right now. And if you do it before February 14th, then you will be guaranteed that lower rate if and when you need it. And if you don't need it because, yay, I passed, you can just cancel with us. So yeah. I'd forgotten about that, but that's absolutely the case. So really important to have that option. And, you know, some people know that they're just, they're concerned about whether or not they're going to get through the exam. It's always nice to have this backup. So it's a terrific experience. I think everyone that's been to boot camp, I honestly don't know anybody that's been to boot camp that thinks it wasn't worth going. It's wonderful to get that direct attention from our full coaching staff there. So we really hope you'll join us. It's a great time. You're going to be doing a lot of hands-on practice. You'll write essays, do MBEs, write performance tests. You'll make mind maps. You will learn to photo read. So there's a lot going on there. All right. So that's what we have going on. Don't forget. Deadline on boot camp is next Wednesday, February 14th. All right, let's go ahead and go to some of the questions. Obviously, we're getting a lot of questions now as people start to turn their attention to the exam directly. And this was a typical kind of question. Students said, the big day is almost here and I'm running out of time. Yeah, you are and you are. They said, it's been tough with work and kids. But then the question was, do any of the videos or links on the online course page go over the actual rules and instructions for the two test days. Well, the short answer to that is you have a study guide book in your online course, and it's got some of that information for your jurisdiction, Florida, California, or Georgia, or generally for the UBE. But where you're going to find most of these rules and instructions will be on your state examiner's website. And that's something you should be looking at on a daily basis right now because things change. And it is not static. It's unfortunately very dynamic at the end. And examiners have this very bad habit of suddenly announcing or quietly announcing changes that they're making and expect you to know. And so you've got to be aware of it. It's worth a visit to the bar examiner's website to see what's there and make sure that you're good on deadlines, make sure that you understand the rules and what's going on. Now, this student went on and asked some specific questions, which I thought were good for everybody. They asked, on MBE day, which would be Wednesday all across the country, is that a laptop day or a Scantron? Well, it's not a laptop day. You do not bring your laptop on Wednesday anywhere in the country. It is a Scantron. You'll be given a booklet with your 100 questions in the morning and 100 questions in the afternoon, and then you'll fill out a Scantron sheet. This will differ based on the jurisdiction. So again, and this is why you don't look at the rules from your bar examiner's websites. If you're in a state like Florida, 
can't bring very much into the room. There are some states that are smaller and less formal, and you can certainly bring a few things in, but not a lot. For Wednesday, bring a pencil. That's really about all you need. Then the student said, on laptop days, do you just walk in with your laptop and plug it in? No. <laughs> Again, you want to look at the examiner's website. You have to have loaded ExamSoft software into your computer. You have to get the computer checked. Typically, this is done the day before the exam. Each jurisdiction handles this process differently. So you've got to check it out. Tracy, you've been working with the next generation exam. Did you notice that the next gen is not going to use exam soft software? Yeah, I did see. Right. We're still not entirely clear how they plan to actually administer this test. But they basically said, well, love you next exam soft, but we're not using it for the next gen. So there you go. In any event, you know, if this student said, well, you know, do you just, you know, plug in your laptop when you arrive in the morning? No, it's not quite that simple. Most everywhere you've got to have your laptop checked and then it's sandboxed and embargoed. So make sure you look at the rules. That's really the key to all of this is go to the website, look at the rules. They're different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Even within the UBE, New York does things differently than Texas. So make sure you're doing that. Yeah, and make bring three pencils that are sharpened, but not too sharp in case you break off the lid. Get an extra power cord for your laptop now and put it in wherever you're going to bring your laptop. An extra cord. We actually had somebody in the last testing uh, go round that ran out of power halfway through and had to switch over to handwriting. So go get it, put it in the case with your laptop and bring two of them with you. Yeah. And start working with your laptop. If you've got the exam soft software, you can do some practice tests on that and make sure it's working. I would say strip it down so that there's really as little on there as possible. It's those extra programs that tend to, you know, break it and make it not work. The other thing I just have to say, because it comes up every exam, Tuesday is laptop day everywhere in the country. We had a student that showed up in July and uh, they showed up on Tuesday thinking that was MBE day and they didn't have their laptop with them and they had to handwrite their essays in the morning. These are sloppy mistakes and you shouldn't make these mistakes. You're going to be a lawyer. You need to know deadlines, rules, and the procedure. So laptop on Tuesday no laptop on Wednesday and go to the website, look at the rules. I guarantee there will be some people that go, what? I was supposed to register for laptop. That date has come and gone everywhere in the country. So if you didn't register, your handwriting, whether you like it or not. If you are using a laptop, start writing your essays and your MPTs on that laptop. A laptop keyboard has smaller keys. So get used to using the computer that you're going to use for the exam. Start using it now. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. This is when you should start figuring out your sleep schedule, when you want to go to bed, when you want to get up, so that you're building your three weeks out and you should figure out what time you plan to go to bed on exam days, what time you're planning to get up and start putting yourself on that schedule. If you're traveling to a different time zone, put yourself on that time zone schedule. You need to start that now because it takes about 20, 21 days to build that habit. So don't forget about doing that. Next, we got a lot of questions about writing and about writing essays. One of the things, Tracy, that I'm seeing right now is that I've, I've really got two kinds of students when it comes to essay writing. I've got the students that have mastered or feel pretty good about the fact law application writing system, and they're employing that and starting to dig into substance even more. And then we've got students that in a fit of panic, forget that they ever heard about FLA and they start trying to do something else. Sometimes it's IRAC, sometimes it's a hybrid of FLA and IRAC, sometimes it's something completely different that maybe they heard about on Reddit. And the result of doing that for that group of students really becomes chaotic here at the end, doesn't it? Oh, so I've read some essays that are all over the board because I can tell someone is full of anxiety about how to write and is not following the process. When we pull them into line on FLA, they can see that their next essay is so much better. Jackson, my individual students are not having any problem writing an FLA, so I guess that means I'm a better coach to you. All right, we'll go with that. Um, Ten being to see. Yeah, A to B to C. So <laughs> you're freaking out about the writing style. 
there's still time to do the writing workshop with Brianna mm -hmm. to writing sessions and she'll drill you down on the FLA. I think that's more valuable than spending time with one of us as coaches. We'd rather dig into substance than at this stage, three weeks out, mm -hmm. be talking to you about writing mechanics. But I do see some mechanics kind of the problems. A student said, I'm really having a problem with getting my timing down on essays. And I think that's true for a lot of people. A student says, I can't get my brain to jumpstart quickly enough for each essay. How do I get going with that? Well, the first thing you do is more mechanical. You outline the call of the question on your computer. And you recognize that you're going to write three paragraphs, fact, legal argument, and application. So you set those up right away. And then you go to the fact paragraph, which is not requiring you to know anything or draw anything out. It's literally there in front of you, and you're just paraphrasing the facts. What that does is it gets your brain moving so that you can start moving through the work. I think one of the dangers is people get analysis paralysis. They get stuck trying to think about the problem when they don't need to do it. Do the things that are mechanical first, get your brain going that way, and then transition into the more substantive work. Some students ask me, can I just skip the fact paragraph? The answer is no. There's a reason to write in the fact paragraph. It's only one or two sentences, so it shouldn't be onerous or take too much of your time. But in doing that, you're really getting your own brain going and you're giving the reader context. And so when I read essays from people that start with the second paragraph, the legal argument, they're just chaotic, and there's Ooh. facts thrown in the second paragraph, there's facts thrown in the third paragraph, and it just doesn't make much sense. And if they just take it a moment to write one or two sentences in the first paragraph, then there's a better flow in that writing. Is that anything that you've seen with students? Yes, this is a recipe for how you write SLA. And it's a recipe for helping you get jump started on every one of the three paragraphs. If you can get these three paragraphs down the way that you need to state them, then you don't have to think about it when you're writing. It's going to be second nature to you. So I'm going to leave this up here for just a little bit and let you screenshot it. It's fine if you use it. Please don't share it because it's copyrighted, but I'm happy to have you share it. I think that the first sentence in your fact paragraph should state the legal relationship between the parties. The reason for that is that that gives you the standard and burden of proof. And then you can pull that down into your other paragraphs. Where I'm seeing a problem, Jackson, is with people writing too much in the application paragraphs and repeating what was in the law paragraph or bringing up new facts that were not disclosed earlier. If you think of writing these essays as an opening statement before a judge, this is what you're going to hear. You are bound to those facts. You can't just start pulling them in everywhere here and there. You're bound to what you say. And then you talk about the law that you're going to use to support your argument, and your argument is X. And then you're going to say, judge, you're also going to hear from the other side, and their argument is Y, and this is the law they're going to use to support the argument. In almost every essay I'm reading, people are forgetting to put the opposing party's law after their argument. They get so hung up on their own argument that they are forgetting the opposite argument. And that is a fatal, that's a fatal flaw. So make sure that you follow party with the burden of proof on the issue first. We'll argue that the law that supports uh, X's argument is this. The opposing party will argue Y and the law that supports Y's argument is this. Your application paragraph doesn't need to be more than three or four sentences. X party wins, not may win, not likely wins, not G, be bold. So-and-so wins because, and you have to discuss the law that you are using and how it relates to these facts. You should I have left time to do recipe. this. Yeah, I really love this recipe. And I think it's a great way to quickly analyze and look at your writing. As you're practicing over the next couple of weeks, I would take this recipe, print it out, put it on your desk as you get through each of those paragraphs and doing the writing that way. The other thing I just say about timing, there are students that really are struggling and they're saying, well, couldn't I just get rid of the fact paragraph? Ultimately, what I find is that when somebody does that, they end up putting the facts somewhere else and it's more of a confusion. It's a hodgepodge. 
if you will, if they'd just done it in the order, it would be more streamlined and they probably could write faster and get more done. I've had some people that say to me, I just can't type fast enough. Look, if you're typing three or four essays every day for the next 21 days, you'll get fast enough. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So don't make excuses, just get in and do the work. And what I'm suggesting is if you're having trouble writing essays, write three or four of them in the same subject and go deep in a subject. And then you'll start to see the patterns in that subject. And the next day, write three or four in another subject so that you're getting some depth. That's a great idea because I'm also seeing some missteps in the understanding of topics. So it's very important that you have an excellent understanding of what you're writing about. It's going to make it easier to write. Yeah. And in that vein for photo readers, I want to talk about my recommendation is right now, because a lot of people start to feel like, well, I just don't know the law well enough. If you're a photo reader, you know the law plenty. The problem is it's not in your conscious brain, it's in the non-conscious. So one of the things I'd like you to be doing is on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights, I'd like all of you to be photo reading, or if you're not a photo reader, really fast skim of the multi-state book outlines. That's seven subject outlines. And I want you to do this before you go to bed. Then on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, do the same thing with your state materials, the outlines. Why do we do it this way? Well, it's designed to let your brain have some time to process it, and you're just layering up. So three times a week, you're looking at each subject again in the course from a written outline standpoint. That's a really helpful tool to get you there. Speaking of tools to help you, we've talked about the essay writing workshop. That's one tool. We also have some tools to help you speed up your studies. There's Bar Maps, which has got the mind maps and the fast finish audio. We also have the multi state video nutshells. These are 15 minute videos where we've sound gapped the soundtrack and it's synced to a series of slides. And it really takes you all the way through a subject in 15 minutes. And then the third thing, paraliminals, either through mind tracks or buying our paraliminal pack and letting those paraliminals work for you in terms of energy and focus and staying calm. So you've got different tools that you can employ here at the end that will save you time and make your writing go faster. When people write three or four essays a day, their typing gets faster. All right. Next question I got, a student said, I'm scheduled to take the professional responsibility exam in March, and I wanted to make sure I had all the study materials. I found only one lecture. Are there practice tests or other material? Yes, it's in the MPRE course. If you're trying to use professional responsibility from the Florida, Georgia, or California courses, that is not sufficient for the MPRE exam. It is a separate course with a lecture and about five or 600 practice questions and some additional information. So make sure you check that out. It is in your online course in the Upgrade Center. You can add that as well. The other thing that comes up is how much time do I need to study for the MPRE? I would say you need about 30 to 40 hours. So if you're planning on taking it in March, this is the time to get underway with some of that study. But don't rely on your Florida professional responsibility to get you through MPRE or your California or your Georgia. It just, it's not going to do it for you. So that's the MPRE. It's a reasonably priced course. It's a compliance exam, not trying to trip you up. I mentioned earlier that we did the February 2024 preview in a couple of states. A student wrote back after they had watched the one, I think in Florida, and they said, one thing confused me about your video. You gave ethics a five, which means highest likelihood of being on the exam. And the student said, I must have been completely wrong. I thought ethics were only tested on the MPRE as the topic of ethics fair game on state day. The answer is yes, in Florida and California, to a lesser extent in Georgia, not at all on the UBE. Um, So don't fall into that trap. There's ethics for the bar exam, and then there's MPRE. They're two separate things. Again, I think you need about 30 hours to study for MPRE. So if you want to wait until after the bar exam, it was finished to start your studies, you can do it. So that's where we are on MPRE. All right, Tracy, you wanted to call yourself a law dog. I don't know what that means, but why don't you talk to us about whatever that is for you? Okay. Thank you. The correct spelling of that is L-A-W-D-A-W-G, law dog. 
that's my Twitter handle, four years into law practice back in 1980, uh, I was given this nickname by one of the judges that I appeared in front of for trials, criminal defense trials. I was one of the few women that had a private practice, much less a courtroom practice, taking on the criminal defense work. There were women in that area of law, but they were mostly prosecutors and public defenders. So I kind of stood out. And this judge started calling me Ms. Law, Ms. Law Dog. I asked him one day, why this name? He said, because you are the most prepared attorney I have ever seen. You are prepared. You are organized. There may be people who are better at writing motions or briefs, but nobody can out prepare you. Well, that kind of stayed with me, that moniker as law dog, and I'm kind of proud of it, actually. This is what I want to tell you. Every time I went into court, every single time, whether it was an appearance and setting of another date, or it was arguing a motion, or it was a pretrial status conference, or it was a hearing, or it was a trial, I was full of anxiety. I was sleep deprived for a couple of days before I went in. And the way that I worked through that was to be totally prepared. Why am I saying this? Because you guys are a couple of weeks ahead of your next bar exam. Maybe it's your first bar exam. I hope it's your last because you're going to pass. But I know that level of anxiety. And I've been practicing law for 41 years. I was a judge for 33 years. That anxiety was always there. You can manage that anxiety through preparation. What do you have that you can use to help you prepare mind maps? You need to get those in a relational way so you can see all the claims on one side, all the defenses on another. When you're looking at the federal rules, you want to group those. When you're looking at secure transactions, you're only being tested on Article 9. Get yourself prepared so that when you see a question in an essay or in the MPT, you know where you're going. You shouldn't be sitting there saying, I don't understand it. At this point, you should be honing in so that when you see a question, you know how to prepare to answer it. And that's why I developed that recipe for you. So you don't have to think about those logistics. We've given you hacks for the MBE, so you don't have to think about that. You're going to use your selective intuition to take that part of the exam. And your MPTs are basically just essays of a different kind. They are either arguments that will go to a legal entity, such as a judge, or non-legal, such as a jury, or they are objective and they're going to go to your partner in the law firm. And they're going to go to a client who is all invested in their case and they don't have a case. So when you think of that, when you prepare and you know those things right off the top of your head, that's your recipe. And that's your way that you combat that anxiety. I want you all to be law dogs. Be bold. Write your essays boldly. Write your MPTs boldly. Make sure your pencils are sharpened boldly. You join me. We'll be a community of law dogs going forward. Yeah. I like that approach, though, Tracy, because I think it's preparation, but it's also having a certain aggressiveness here to be fully ready to go. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what these last three weeks look like as you start to get ready. Three weeks is still a long time until the exam. We're still only seven days closer than we were last week when we were talking about this. It just goes really slowly at the end. I already mentioned one thing I want you to do, which is to read your outlines Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Do your multi-state outlines. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, do your state outlines. Do them before you go to bed. Sleep on them and be ready the next morning. Secondly, be reviewing your mind maps. This is a good time to pull out your mind maps and to be reading them out loud and recording them. Put them on an MP3 on your phone and then put it on a loop and put it under your pillow at night. Put it at the lowest volume so that it's literally inaudible to you and just let it run. You'll find that during the night you wake up, not just because you have to go to the bathroom, but just because your brain is filled up. 
and then you just turn off your phone and you're done. But going through those mind maps is really important to be able to give you a opportunity to take the work and to hear it in your own voice. So that's the second thing to be doing. A third thing that I'd like you to be doing in this period of time is to start to look at the things you don't know. Find the subjects. Tracy mentioned a couple of subjects. Find the subjects you don't know and go deep. Write a few essays in that subject. Don't just write one. If it's secure transactions in your jurisdiction, write three or four of them, review them, and then add the information to your mind maps. The MBE, the multi-state bar exam, as you're doing the practice tests, I gave you the order in which I want you to do the practice tests. And I want to remind you that really very few of them are predictive. They're really still for the purpose of helping you learn the law, focus on what you don't know as you work through those. So again, make sure that you're giving yourself time to do the OPEs and then to do the practice full length exams under test conditions. Starting next week, we'll start to see more and more people moving into that realm. So that's the, the next thing. When it comes to the performance tests, if you're in a performance test jurisdiction, I suggest you do at least one performance test a week over the next three weeks. If you're having trouble with performance tests, do more. Most of those should be the tests that are designed to go to a legal audience, whether they're persuasive or objective. Those are the two kinds of performance tests that are most likely to be on the bar exam. And then finally, work on mindset. Expect to pass. Expect to go in and be successful on the exam. Don't start thinking about, I'm not going to be successful. It's not going to go. I don't get this. I'm not learning this. Particularly if you're a photo reader, you're going to be aware that you don't know things consciously. And it's not until you do questions that you begin to understand how much you really do know. But sometimes people stop at that first point and they think, I don't have a conscious recollection, therefore I don't know it. And then they start panicking and they try to memorize or start making extra notes. You don't need to do any of that. Trust the process, trust the system. It works. You just have to do it. If you'll do it, it works. I think, Tracy, this is probably the most frustrating thing for me for 30 years is that if people just do what we ask them to do, it works. It's when people get freaked out when they become Wiley e. Coyote running off the side of the mountain. They go, oh my God, what am I doing? They stop using the tools and then things blow up for them. That's what we don't want them to do. As you're thinking about these three weeks, be deliberate in what you're doing. Be intentional. Watch my daily emails. There's a lot of really direct advice there. And there's also a lot of videos that I've done that I think are really well suited to each day in this process. Don't skip that. That's what I see when it comes to the next three weeks. Any thoughts about that, Trace? And you know, you do have to pick and choose what you're going to do from this point out. But the first thing you should do each day is read the email from Jackson and listen to whatever video he posts because they are absolute nuggets. And the first year that I was working with him, I read those every day and I listened to them every day. And it's amazing how quickly I picked things up. There are lots of aha moments in those. Don't pass those by. Right. Use your keyboard. So you are very comfortable when you go in there. Don't be afraid of things like secure transactions. Secure transactions is about the easiest topic there is because it is so cut and dry. Don't be afraid of big words and topics. Yeah, that's right. Keep your sense of humor, folks, as you go through the your weeks. In the emails that I've sent out, I've tried to be inspirational in some of them. I've tried to be practical in some of them. You're going to see some coming up at about the 14 day or the 10 day mark that get into more specifics. If you're a super achiever, you can always go look at the whole list of the countdown videos and jump to one that's a few days ahead. We've been updating a lot of those videos, so I encourage you to watch them. I think that's all we've got for today. I hope this has been helpful for everybody today. Just remind you that if you're taking the exam in July of 2024 or later, you definitely want to be registering for boot camp. If you're a February 24 bar taker, you can reserve your spot for the boot camp with a refundable $100 deposit. The deadline is a week from today. Tracy, thank you for being here as always. Next week, we will be back and we'll have Brianna or Amanda or both. Maybe we'll have June. It's hard to know. Coaches are all busy working with students, so we're glad that they're doing that. Check the community page for our group coaching calls. They're doing their regular calls this week. Have a great study week, everyone. 
and we will see you all next week on Valentine's Day. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. All right.